In this video, we're going to look at implicit differentiation. So let's just jump right into it. Example A, consider the circle of radius five centered at the origin. It is the graph of the equation x squared plus y squared equals 25. Our problem is to find the slope of the tangent for any point on the circle. Well, almost any point because you should realize there are two points on the circle where the tangent line is going to be vertical and the tangent slope formula should be very much undefined at those two points. So putting those two points aside, we're going to find the tangent slope of uh, any other point on the circle. So the first thing to notice is that the circle does not pass the vertical line test. It does not show you y explicitly as a function of x. And you can see this when you try to solve explicitly for y, y squared equals 25 minus x squared, y equals plus or minus the square root of 25 minus x squared. So what's going on here is we're actually getting two explicit functions. We can either take the positive root, which will give us y equals square root of 25 minus x squared, whose graph is the upper half of the circle, or we could look at y equals negative square root of 25 minus x squared, and that, was, that would give us the graph of the lower half of the circle. Now, if we want the tangent slope for any point on the upper half, um, probably the easiest way to do this is to express uh, our function as 25 minus x squared to the 1 half power, use the power rule and the chain rule, and simplify that and we find out that dy dx is negative x over the square root of 25 minus x squared. So if uh, we label the function f top equals the square root of 25 minus x squared, then f prime top is given by this formula. And of course there's a corresponding formula for the bottom half which essentially differs only by a factor of negative one. And so we have two different functions, one for the top half and one for the bottom half, and given any point besides the points at the sides of the circle, we should be able to find the tangent slope. And we'll just point out that none of the four values you get by attempting to plug in negative five or five to either one of these functions is going to work. So none of these quantities are defined and to be very explicit about this, if you attempt to plug in five or negative five into either one of these formulas, you're going to get zero in the denominator and that's not good for anybody. So um, these arguments aren't going to be in the domain of the, either the top or the bottom derivatives. So suppose you want to find the tangent slope on the bottom half of the circle where uh, the x coordinate is equal to three. So we're going to choose the derivative for the bottom half. We're going to plug 3 into that formula. And when all the dust settles, you see that the slope is 3 quarters. And there you go. The tangent slope is 3 quarters. All right. So this is all good. But let's just take a little diversion here. What if you were tasked to find the derivative with respect to x of some blob raised to the 17th power? And you'd say, well, I know the power rule, so that should be 17 times the blob raised to the 16th. And then you say, well, wait a second, the blob itself might be some function of x, so we better be safe and, and apply the chain rule. We're going to multiply by the derivative of whatever that thing is with respect to x, because that's what the chain rule says we should do when we have a composition and we have no reason to believe that this blob is not a function of x. So that's what we need to do. And then sure enough, a few minutes later, you find out, well, actually that blob is explicitly x cubed plus one. And the work you did is still valid because you'd say, well, okay, so then I'll substitute x cubed plus one there. And by the way, I know that the derivative with respect to x of x cubed plus one is three x squared. That's my derivative. Let's suppose you were supposed to take the derivative with respect to x of sine of something. You'd say, well, derivative of sine of something is cosine of something. But chain rule tells me if that something's a function of x, I better take the derivative of that thing with respect to x. And then sure enough, a few minutes later, you find out, well, that thing was x to the fifth. So we'll substitute x to the fifth there. And the derivative of x to the fifth is 5x to the fourth. There's your derivative. 
derivative of e to the something is e to the something, except we need to apply the chain rule. Multiply this by the derivative of that something with respect to x. And then we come to find out that the something was actually tan x. So we'll substitute tan x there, and the derivative of tan x is secant squared x. Now take a good look at these three uh, problems. These are all basic problems you could have faced after you learned the chain rule. And yet, here, in the absence of explicit information, we still could have done the problem to the extent possible. We just would have needed to remember the chain rule. Now we don't usually use an orange sphere and a purple box and a green blob as variables. Uh, in this case, these are all just representing some unknown function of x, so the more typical thing to do is to call this f of x. So let's just swap out each of these explicit formulas for some sort of ambiguous um, case where the inner part of the composition is represented by f of x, and you get these formulas. And these are all perfectly correct, even though we don't know exactly what f of x is. And we can even take this one step further. We can say, well, if we substitute the variable name y for f of x, then Leibniz notation suggests that the derivative should just be dy dx. And we're going to swap that out in each of these cases, and we're going to get these expressions. Now, congratulations, because you've basically just learned how to perform implicit differentiation. When we know y is a function of x, but we don't have an explicit formula for y, we can still take the derivative with respect to x. And the key is just don't forget the chain rule. That's really the key to the whole thing. So you're going to apply the usual derivative rules, and you're going to apply the chain rule. So here we go. Suppose you have any expression involving possibly x and other variable quantities assumed to be functions of x. If you want to take the derivative of that expression, then there's a very simple set of rules to do so. Rule 1. Any variable quantity that is not x requires an application of the chain rule. Rule 2. All other rules of differentiation apply. And that's the end of the story. Now, you can take the derivative with respect to x. You can take the derivative with respect to u, with respect to t, with respect to any variable you want. And the rules of the game are going to change accordingly. It's just you have to keep track of the independent variable with respect to which you are taking the derivative. But the same kinds of rules apply. Now, this rule sounds very complicated in the abstract, but it's actually very simple in the application. So suppose you wanted to take the derivative with respect to x of x squared times sine y. Well, the first thing you should notice is that it is a product. So we're going to use the product rule. We're going to take the derivative with respect to x of x squared times sine y plus x squared times the derivative with respect to x of sine y. The left-hand term is just going to be 2x times sine y, and the second term is going to be x squared times cosine y times dy dx, because that's the chain rule in action. y is presumably some function of x, so to be safe, we're going to throw in that uh, product there. What if we wanted to take the derivative with respect to u of w times z? So what's going on here? We really don't know, but we have to assume, unless we're given information to the contrary, that w and z are functions of u, and so we're going to use the product rule again. And if we use our Leibniz notation and simplify this, we're going to get this expression here, but that will be the derivative of wz with respect to u. So let's really change gears and imagine that an object is hurtling along a line in space, and it's got mass m and velocity v. And the momentum then, by definition, is the product of m and v. 
and the rate of change of momentum would be dp dt and our task is to take this derivative well what if the velocity is changing possibly as a function of t and what if the mass is also changing as a function of t so maybe it's heating up and shedding gas it's a comet that's shedding ice who knows what's going on but we know that both the mass and the velocity are some function of t well we're going to use implicit differentiation and we're going to find that dp dt is m dv dt plus v dm dt now for those of you who've taken physics this might look a little strange but what's going on here is that if m is constant in other words we're supposing that the mass doesn't change so it's not shedding mass or um, gathering mass somehow um, well then dm dt is zero and so this formula just reduces to this somewhat more recognizable formula um, that gives you the rate of change of momentum but more generally if the velocity and the mass are both functions of t then you'd have to use this formula for dp dt all right enough of our little excursion let's go back to the original example of the circle so we're going to go right back to our original equation and now armed with implicit differentiation we can simply take the derivative with respect to x and we're going to get 2x plus 2y dy dx equals 0 and we're going to solve this for dy dx and we're going to get dy dx equals negative x over y it's one formula that tells us the tangent slope for any point on the circle except maybe we should notice that the formula is undefined when y equals zero but of course when y equals zero we're talking about these two points where we already knew the tangent slope was undefined so that's not surprising but any other point on the circle this formula is going to give us the tangent slope now on the upper half of the circle we know that y explicitly is the square root of 25 minus x squared please notice that if you substitute this back into the formula that we just derived at the top you will recover the formula for the derivative of the top half of the circle and similarly on the lower half y equals negative square root of 25 minus x squared and you can substitute that in and recover the derivative formula for the bottom half now generally to use this formula both x and y coordinates are required so if we wanted to go back to our uh, problem we saw earlier at this point on the lower half we have to actually go in and find the y coordinate in this case negative 4 and then we'll plug in both the x and the y coordinates into our formula and we obtain 3 quarters which is the tangent slope at this point okay for this next example we're going to get a big assist from the wonderful online graphing utility Desmos we're going to look at the graph of x cubed plus 4xy squared minus 8 sine of pi y equals 16 a ferocious looking equation but it seems that the point 2 comma 1 is on that graph so let's verify that that's the case if you substitute 2 for x and y for 1 and simplify this left hand side of the equation you get 16 and so um, 2 comma 1 actually satisfies the equation so it is therefore on the graph and our problem is going to be to find the equation of the line tangent to the graph at this point now let's think about this for a second we need to find dy dx at the point 2 comma 1 suppose you could solve for y explicitly in terms of x my hunch is even if you could do that it's going to be ugly and that's not even the end of the story because whatever you find you then need to take the derivative of that thing with respect to x this looks quite unpromising and it's most likely impossible to do in the first place so we're going to have to use implicit differentiation so the derivative of x cubed with respect to x easy 3x squared 
the derivative of 4xy squared with respect to x, we're going to have to use the product rule and make sure we use the chain rule, but we get this expression. And then finally, the derivative of negative 8 sine of pi y, well, that's negative 8 times the derivative of sine pi y, which is going to be negative 8 cosine pi y pi dy dx. We'll just pull the pi in front. And of course, the derivative of 16 is 0. So there's the result of applying implicit differentiation. So at this point, you could sort of grind the wheels of algebra and find a formula for dy dx in terms of x and y. But we only really care about what happens at the point 2 comma 1. We have no other application for this derivative. So an option available to us then is to simply substitute this information in right now. And if we do that, we're going to get a much simpler equation to solve for dy dx. And in fact, when all the dust settles, we find out that dy dx is negative 2 over pi plus 2. And now we can go back to our original graph and plot using point-slope formula the equation of the tangent line and we can double check this in Desmos and it really looks good. So implicit differentiation is a very valuable tool that allows you to find formulas for dy dx in situations where solving for y explicitly is either undesirable or maybe even flat out impossible. And it's the basis of many other kinds of tricks uh, down the road. So it's a really powerful method that's worth understanding. And the key is just to remember it's all about the chain rule. If you just remember the chain rule, you can't go wrong.